Thank you. Uh, Bob, we'll, we'll cover this briefly, but Michael, you guys did three plays in between all this. Twigs, uh, God's Favorite, and Thieves. I think uh, Twigs was a good experience for you, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was a good experience. We left Boston and the show went on. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie Harper got on one bus, we got another bus, you know, and uh, no, you know, we thought we go after uh, well seesaw and then getting ready for chorus line where we knew we were going to be working for a hundred dollars a week for a year. We thought, oh, let's do this Neil Simon play that you're being off. It will make some money. God's favorite, boom. And then uh, the other play was Thieves, which Herb Gardner wrote. And uh, it just didn't work out for Michael or Valerie Harper. And we gladly left it. And uh, Chuck Groden took over the direction. And Marlo Th Thomas replaced Valerie. And the other one was what? Uh, Seda Thompson, Twigs. Oh, Twigs. Twigs was great. Uh, Seda taught me more about acting than anybody I ever met, because I used to coach her in the dialogue and uh, help her memorize. She was a brilliant, brilliant woman. But I, I loved it. I mean, we, um, to jump to the end, we were getting ready to open in New York City, and we had sold two tickets for opening night, $28 worth. And I was walking up and down 44th Street and 45th Street, Anybody I knew, I was giving them tickets to the show. Please come, please come, please come. We've got to fill this theater. But you know what? We opened with a $28 advance. We ran a year, and Seda won the Tony. So and that was, was good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, let's, let's go on to ballroom, yeah. Uh, all right, ballroom. Um, we have Dorothy Danner here, who was a ballroom person. Uh, good experience? Oh, it was, uh, it was fascinating. First of all, we got to take class every day. That was wonderful. We opened 890 Broadway, and that was uh, terrific. And um, to be with all those wonderful people that we'd worked with over the years, so that was great. Uh, it was also it was a very unusual experience. I know you did four prologues. <laughs> But I think we did 11 opening numbers for Ballroom. And, and it started, it was, it was fascinating because it was a big open space. It was Mari's funeral. We were singing in Hebrew, the Kaddish, and it was very abstract and marvelous. And then, for many, many reasons, things were sort of whittled away and it became more a commercial project. And so, unlike yours that you know turned into something wonderful one one afternoon um this opened then in a shop and so all of that marvelous work where it seemed for that project michael was the most brilliant and then when he when we got to tables and chairs it um, there was a different feeling about the show but it was great and and being in the room um, because I had a role in it and I could watch all these people that I admired so much and just watch them struggle and try to tell the story, find the best way to tell the story. We also had three leading couples. I'd never been in a show where that happened. It, we started with Dolores Gray and then we went um, to Alan Ann McCleary and then Dorothy Loudon and Mandy Patinkin was in it for, for six weeks. And the whole thing was a very enriching experience. Yeah. Now there was. It's it's written that uh, after you opened, you f the company felt abandoned. Do you have any feelings about that? Uh, oh, not at all. I mean, I think Michael. Good, yeah. I thought Michael was going through such a stressful period to try to follow chorus line. Oh my God, you know. And he was quite open. You said that it also. And Michael was, produced the show by himself. I mean, it was his money and his... his was that, that after the PAP experience? Uh, after Chorus Line, you know. And no, but said, after we auditioned with PAP that day? Oh, yeah. No, no, that just happened. And PAP thought it wasn't right for the public. Mm -hmm. But you know what the best thing about it was that we uh, auditioned and hired a bunch of people that were all like you guys in this room. And by opening night, they, you swore they were all 18 years yes. old. Oh, I know. They lost the weight, the faces, the makeup. They were totally different people. And also, it was an older crowd. It wasn't like the crowd today. Forgive me for all of this. But, you know, today, they're out of the show as much as they're in the show. 
And so this gang, the curtain was at eight, they'd arrive at six o'clock, they'd all <laughs> hang out with each other, coffee clutch time, then they'd go to the dressing room and put on their makeup and out of town in Stratford, after the curtain came down, they'd all go to the lobby and hang out together for another hour or two. Mm. And they were so thrilled to be there. And it really changed their lives quite a bit. I think the saddest thing about the show closing after three months was that those folks who were resurrected, so to speak, lost this job, and it was like a great high for them. You know, it was a wonderful experience. And that's where I got all my jo joy from, was watching them. And boy, did they dance great. I was jealous that I didn't get to be in that. <laughs> it was a beautiful show. I could not believe the music. It was stunning. And he got his first total blackout. <laughs> yeah. Maybe yes, so. it did. Yeah. It seems to me I have some recollection of Michael wanting the perfect blackout, which, you know, when you have the exit signs and there was that beat. I remember sitting there and it went so black in that house that you have that kind of almost heady feeling and then it's back up. It was a gorgeous show. But in a way, I felt like that was one that I saw the, the, the end. It, it need, he needed another two weeks. Yeah. It felt like that at the end to me. And it was a brilliant show. Well, even when we were, um, we were in New York doing previews and we were getting, um, the, the writer had been replaced by Larry Gelbart. And so we would get scenes over the telephone and we write them on our hands. And then I'd put on a blonde wig and go out and do the hustle with darling Victor Griffin. So when it came time then to go on for the scene, you'd look down because you'd just gotten it and there wasn't anything legible in your <laughs> So, so it, it, you know, to the last minute, I mean, they were trying, trying yeah. to find the best way. Yeah. At the last minute, we took a desperate attempt to re-energize the show with Larry Galbart's work, mm -hmm. to punch it up, a little stronger numbers, to, like you said, make it a little more commercial, a little less downbeat. And, you know, we were proud of it. Ultimately, the book didn't work totally. Uh, the character of the husband, the boyfriend, the mailman didn't work. Vinny came in as a favor to help us find the character. And then when we wanted to cast it with a proper leading man, he went, oh, please let me do it. And Michael went, oh, okay, Vinny. You know, and I don't know. You know, in our dreams, when we first thought of the show and we wanted to cast it, we wanted Beverly Sills and Dick Van Dyke. That's who we thought <laughs> would have been ideal, you know, but things don't work out that way. <laughs> Uh, well, we have to go on to Dream Girls. Um, on again, off again. Tom Ian directing, Michael directing, Tom Ian again directing. Jennifer not there. Uh, was it tough or? Uh? It was brutal, <laughs> and it was all of that. And every workshop was a different ball game. And one one workshop, Jennifer Lewis was Effie, and another one. Uh, Elena Reed. Huh? Elena Reed. Elena Reed did the reading and sold it for us to uh, Bernie and Jerry and uh, Geffen and John Kluge uh, so we could go ahead with it. But it was tough. It was very tough pulling it together. And Tom was slow. Michael was slow. Uh, just finding the right temperature for the show and uh, Make it, making it cohesive and have weight and merit. Because it was easy to do the numbers and just do this like flashy musical, but to have, to give it importance and to give it meaning and, and to talk about uh, a black artist in a white world and how they could cross over into the white world and make that clear and to teach the audience what the music what business was about and the, uh, the things that uh, this culture had to deal with.